Welcome back to Interjections, fresh off a 2-0 win over Empoli. Here to talk about it, I'm your host, Andrew. I've got Miko, Irfan, and Sterling with me. Miko, I'm sure you're feeling great after a nice Inter victory. Yeah, absolutely. It was a long way after the national team break, so good to, good to have some interaction again. Irfan, I'm sure you're excited to have Inter back in your life. Yeah, plus 14. I'm excited. Let's get it. Sterling, thanks as always for stepping in. Really appreciate having you here. Absolutely. I'm happy to be back, and the Scudetto party is back on. So let's talk about it. So there was a lot of nervousness amongst some Inter fans. Just a lot had been going wrong, dropping out of the Champions League, the dropped points against Napoli, the Acerbi incidents. And as a result, people were getting a little paranoid about it. Is Milan really going to challenge for the Scudetto? Is you know, Do we have genuine reasons to be concerned and with the injuries and Aldero stepping in just pe- people were on edge so a real nice professional victory today 2-0 against one of the lowest scoring teams in the league got the job done and just helped relieve pressure and you know Sterling to Sterling's point the Scudetto party's back on so Miko what did you see today? And I, you're Mr. Calm, but I mean, th- this win, picking up three points, it has to make you feel a little bit better, right? Just knowing, okay, we're back in control of our destiny and fate right now. Like, things are calm again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I got to say, when the when the game started and we scored pretty soon from the start, uh, it felt like, okay, we're going to cruise we're gonna cruise to victory in this in this match, but that wasn't quite quite the case. Uh, but in the end, it went well, and it's uh, well. I gotta say, I was pretty calm even before the match, but uh, but uh, I think now everyone else should be as well. Yeah, I mean, it's there's a huge gap in the standings and our performances reflect the dominance we've had in the league this year but still you know how as jay likes to say you have two bad games in a row and it's creasy inter uh sterling wanted to get your thoughts i mean we got our early goal here really made things comfortable early with a just wonderful demarco strike this is his second great goal against empoli this year just thoughts on the goal and just demarco's performance as a whole Yeah, it was an awesome goal. Um, I mean, he took it basically first time on the volley um, after a really nice uh, cross from Bastoni that had a little bit of a a bounce in it. It's a very tough technique. Um, He was pretty unmarked towards the edge of the box, um, which, you know, tends to happen with him sometimes because, again, if you remember, this is our left wing back and he's popping up on the right wing sometimes. Sometimes he's even further forward on the field than Lautaro and Taram. Um, sometimes he kind of pops up in the midfield. I mean, he was not in a position where theoretically a left wing back should be, but he's been getting in those types of positions all year. And uh, yeah, it was a really well taken finish. And I would say that it was really good for us to get the early goal today. Um, I know this is the anti crisis inter podcast, um, especially since Jay's not here today. But, um, you know, if I was going to be the, the negative person, I would say that this is one of those matches where you don't want to let it drag on at a zero zero um, and get into the second half when you haven't taken the lead yet, because, you know, it, it will start to get a little hairy. Um, the fans will start to get a little disgruntled. The players can certainly feel that. And the truth is you hadn't won in a couple of games. So it's important to go ahead and take that early lead. We did that. And obviously, yeah, professional performance from there on out. If we were to nitpick this results and be a little critical of it. I don't have much to say in the way of Empoli chances. I mean, they had a screamer from outside the box, Adero tipped over. That was one of the few pain points. But where I look at and see a bit of concern is another game, another game where our starting forwards don't get a goal. You had Lotaro subbed off, a pretty underwhelming effort by his standards. Taram, I thought, was definitely better than Lotaro, more dangerous. But once again, just, you know, Another game, no goals from the forwards. Miko, like, where are you at in terms of the forward play? Like, are you willing to say Lataro's in a scoring slump? Well, I don't know how many games is it, but yeah, maybe, maybe it is. I think, I think he's feeling it right now. He, it from his uh, like 
body language and reactions, he's really frustrated because he hasn't scored for a while. For a while, so uh, and he was he was poor today. I don't know. Is it the just just the burden from the whole season because he's like carried carried the attack from uh, of this team and he has played so much. Well, Turam has played pretty much as well. So I don't know if it, if it's like starting to take a toll on on both of the guys at this this uh, this moment of the season. And Lautaro ha- had this travel to America and back, so that's there's traveling traveling as well. So I don't know it. it I'm I'm not of course I'm not con- concerned. I'm I'm never concerned, but <laughs> but. Uh, because we, we get the goals anyway but uh but yeah it doesn't doesn't look great great for Lautaro at the moment I don't think there's any debating that the confidence really of the team overall probably had taken a little bit of a knock after the Atletico match um I think that Lautaro kind of has shown that as well um, with his form in recent matches it's not that he's played poorly it's just his there's a little bit of a lack of conviction there um, in his in his finishing and just really the kind of the way that he's been approaching the match. What I would say is that um, he did score for Argentina over the break. I think that'll do him a world of good. That's a little bit of a monkey off of his back. And he did have his chances today. Um, he had one actually really early on, even before DeMarco scored, that I thought he could have done a little bit better with, a little headed chance. But um, I'm not too concerned about um, Lautaro. Uh, if he if he scores next game, he'll be right back, I think, to where he was previously. Um, what would concern me is if he would go like five matches, because <laughs> that's when I think um, he starts to have some of those little mental demons start to pop back up. But I think at this point, it's three matches without a goal. Every striker kind of has those moments of the season. Not a big deal as long as he doesn't let it become a big deal. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll, uh, I pretty much agree with that. It's, you know, the the biggest takeaway I had watching this match was I felt like both Taram and Lotaro have been kind of out of form. Um, they just haven't looked that great or that crisp uh, in all kind of facets of the game. I mean, they're, they're still good. There's no denying that they're not that they're, they're there's no denying that they're good players, and no one can say that they're playing horribly. But it's just they're not up to the same level as we've seen them kind of throughout the year. Um, and so I agree. I'm not concerned. Three matches isn't a huge deal. But, you know, until this season, we've known that Lotaro is streaky and he can go on these runs where he doesn't score goals for multiple, multiple games, sometimes like a month or two at a time. And so I think we all have to kind of just be on the lookout if we start to see signs of that. And I do think that there are some signs of that, it, more so than just the way he is on the pitch. Like some of his body language and stuff has been a little bit lacking. He was frustrated today to be taken off the pitch. And I think I get that. I don't think I necessarily hold that against him. It probably means that maybe he felt like he you know, could have broken through today and he was upset to be taken off. So I don't think that that means anything one way or another but just in terms of like general body language and involvement he just doesn't look as crisp and um i don't know just uh you know sharp as he usually is so hopefully that'll change um uh, in the next match i actually thought he had the stronger match in comparison to um Taram today i know andrew said he thought otherwise but um i felt like Taram's link up play especially in the first half was extremely poor um, a lot of giveaways just kind of seemed like he was a little bit off the pace. I'm actually probably a little bit more concerned with Taram's current form than I am Lautaro's. Um, I think it's been a little bit longer since he's found the back of the net. And I think that when we initially signed him, this was kind of one of those concerns that we all kind of had as Inter fans is, you know, is this guy really going to be a goal scorer or is he kind of a winger who's going to be creative and tricky at times, but, is going to kind of fluff his lines in front of the in front of the goal, and um, I would say in the last month and a half or so, we've started to see more of that version of Taram. It kind of coincided with his injury and that little bit of time he had out, uh, but we have seen a little bit more of that version of Taram recently. So, I would say of the two strikers, um, would would probably be more important for Taram to get that next goal and to get back in form so we can finish the season strong. Yeah, and it's it's a uh, in a sense. It's not so uh, not so worrying because, like said, we are 
14 points lead at the moment. So like they, they we could say that they've done their their job already. They've scored enough goals so that we are where we are now. And uh, if we have some, if if they both both have some kind of a, like a crowd now, it it really doesn't matter too much because we don't even need their goals anymore because we are about to like win the Scudetto like in a in a few matches probably or in a month or something so uh, if the if the cold crowd comes now it's just fine because it's almost over already so that that that's how I how I see this that like uh, they they've done their job they've they've carried the attack because the bench isn't so great well sanchez has been a bit better lately in, in like past what two months maybe two three months so th- that that's been helpful for us but uh i would see that it's it doesn't matter anymore if they if they don't score too much but of course would like to see for example louder to score more and, and like be the be the Capo Canonier and and uh, and he he will most probably probably win that that one, but uh, would 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 be nice to see him get a few more goals. Yeah, just for context, so the last few wins we've had Bologna and Genoa, like none of the starting, neither Taram nor Lotaro were scoring. I think you have to go back to. I don't know, Atalanta or Lecce for a Lotaro goal. And, you know, that was in February. And then for Taram, you're going back even further. You're going back to, what, Salernitana back in the middle of February. So that just feels like it's been a while since either of these guys have scored. And if we were in an actual Scudetto race and things weren't wrapped up, we'd be the first one sitting up here ringing the, ringing the bell. But it has coincided with a nice pickup in form by Sanchez I've been impressed with Sanchez. I know I was very harsh on him in some earlier episodes, but I feel like his performance has grown. He's clearly a superior option to Arnautovic at this point, you know, even ignoring Arnautovic's injury concerns. Just Sanchez has been playing much better, and he picked up a nice goal today. Um, Ir- Irfan, what did you think of Sanchez's substitute appearance, his goal? And I'll even let you chime in on Aslani, who, as you predicted, you know, he appears on the pitch and we win a game again. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's that's exactly right. Sanchez has been impressive uh and i too like you was harsh on him and still am harsh on him at times but you know uh, he proves over and over again that he can get into good positions and once he starts to deliver you know maybe he'll get hot um and the goal today was actually a really important goal so props to him um i'm glad that he's found some form and he's scoring and contributing and like you said uh, i was glad that aslani got on the pitch and uh, did his thing and once again he got on and we won. I have noticed that uh, Hakan seems a little bit more um, rusty to me. I don't know if it's just like general fatigue or, you know, he was injured for a while too, but um, it definitely seems like the, um, you know, the midfield is kind of slowing down a little bit too, though I feel like Barella actually has been in a better run of form than he's been, I think, at times this season. So it's going to get kind of getting a little bit offset by that. Yeah, Barella has been one of the best performers over the past few games, minus his his finishing, which he had another horrible attempt on goal after a nice DeMarco pullback today. Uh, Miko, what were your thoughts on Odero? We, I just ask because Summer's up there in age. We need a reserve keeper for next season. Odero's here on loan from Sampdoria. The general consensus seems to be He's being shipped back, but did you see? You know, he kept a clean sheet today, albeit against one of the lowest scoring teams in the league. Did you see anything today that makes you think, like, hey, he can be a long term reserve keeper for us? Well, uh, I, I didn't see anything like that because Empoli didn't really like create enough threat to to test him in a sense that there was this one one long shot with with um, which was. Uh, good one and Odera saved it pretty well so props to him but I don't think there was nothing else he like uh, which could have caused him any problems or anything but he, he played well with the with the with his feet and he was 
clearly has trained that so he can play behind our team. So nothing wrong in his play, but I, I don't think we're going to redeem him. I think it, the price is like 8 million or something. I think we're gonna find out something else for our second keeper spot in the summer. But let's see. Let's see. It, it could be that we don't have more money than 8 million. So. Well, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to the rumor mill recently, but there's this guy, Bento, um, from Atletico Paranese in, um, in Brazil, who has been uh, really flirting pretty heavily with Inter in the media uh, over the last, I don't know, two or three weeks. Um, he's been getting some caps for Brazil as well. He started both of the national team games during the, uh, during the last international break. He does seem like quite a talent. He's 24 years old. And we've been linked to him in uh, prior years. Last summer, there was some talk about him potentially being the uh, goalie purchase before we tried to go after Trubin and then obviously ended up with Sommer. Um, but it does seem like that may really be a thing, uh, which would be surprising to me. Not because I don't think that the guy is good enough. I, I certainly would be happy to have him here. Uh, but more so just because of the money that's going to be potentially associated with that move. It sounds like um, they're wanting 14, 15 million euros, which I just don't know if we have that money to spend on a goalkeeper right now. I mean, maybe if we think this guy's really a stud in the next Julio Cesar, we'll, we'll go that route. But um, it does seem like maybe we are inching closer to buying a starter and moving Sommer into more of a reserve type of role and uh, as opposed to keeping Sommer as the starter and signing a reserve goalkeeper. Yeah, that could be the case, but but let's see. Uh, I'm also a bit concerned about the, the transfer fee the Brazilians will, will demand. So let's see, let's see. Would be interesting to get this guy for sure. Yeah, it, I always struggle to spend large sums of money on a keeper when you have a serviceable one. I know summer is up there in age, but it's just like we operate with such a fine financial constraints. We all know we need, would like at least an attacker a central center back for to replace a Cherubi. We'll get into it. So just on my priority list, spending anything more than ten million on a keeper would be lower on it. I I will say I, I'm a I'm a steadfast De Gregorio guy. If we're going to sign a keeper, he he's my preference. But yeah, the, the cost of these guys just seems like we can't compete in that market. So maybe Onana is available on loan from United after a disappointing season. I don't know. <laughs> uh, let, let's talk about the charity. There's So when we previewed this game, we thought there was a chance a charity would not participate in it. He ended up playing, starting. There's been a few interesting reports after everything that came from this. Uh, the first being that Inter is unhappy with him, that relations are frayed. There are some reports saying we're planning on moving on from him this summer. Um, multiple reports from Gazetta saying, look, these guys are going to be f- looking for replacements. And looking for replacements is going to be prudent regardless because you have a 35-year-old center back who can only play in one position. So it, it makes sense that we're looking externally, but Sterling, what are your thoughts on a Cherubi returning to the team? It doesn't seem like he skipped a beat from a performance perspective. And just long term, is there anyone you want? I've seen um, Schurz from Torino was linked to him. Brongiorno from Atalanta was linked to him. Like, do any of those names stick out to you? Yeah, I mean, to answer the first question in regards to a Cherubi returning back to the, returning back to the team, I mean. Listen, um, I have my own opinions on the whole Juan Jesus incident. I won't get too deep into that, but I'll just go as far as saying I don't see why Juan would lie about it. Um, the one thing I would say about the way that the FIGC handled that Aturbi case, and, and one thing I will give them credit for is how quickly they handled it. Um, it was all handled during the international break, and at least they made a swift decision and didn't draw it out any longer than was necessary. And look, if the guy is um, found innocent, then he should be allowed to play, and he should play because he's a starter in this team. So, um, you know, I thought he was fine today. I think that he can continue to be fine uh, from a playing perspective with this team for at least another year, maybe two years, um, even though he's getting on there in age. I mean, the, the style of his game, I think, uh, suits us really well. Um, I mean, 
he was playing a very interesting match today. A lot of his match was actually spent in midfield um, instead of in the in the back line, which I'm sure was uh, something that Inzaghi worked on with them tactically um, prior to the match starting. But um, but yeah, in terms of a long term replacement for him, there's some interesting options out there. Um, I do like Bongiorno, who is at Torino. I feel like he's the most natural, a Cherby like fit for us. Um, for some reason, I still think that that central center back position just works really well with a you know an old school minded Italian type of defender um, sitting there as kind of the bedrock in that defense. Um, I haven't seen enough of Bongiorno in terms of distribution to say if he's going to be as good on the ball as a Cherby is, who is deceptively good on the ball. He's actually a very you know adept passer even under pressure. Um, but I would say Bongiorno would probably be my my number one pick. Um, I have seen some people in the forum talk about you know a cheap option there like a Varane, um, which I would actually be okay with. I think that he could potentially be a really good you know he's only thirty years old could be a good you know, two or three year option there, maybe even longer if he, if he uh, impresses. Um, and that's kind of historically the type of signings we've made in this team, specifically in the back line. And a lot of those actually have turned out well for us, a Cherby being one of them, obviously. Um, so I'd be, I'd be open to that as well. So I guess for the, if you're going to spend money, I'd probably go for Bongiorno. If you're going to try and get something cheap, I'd probably go for Varane. I want to, I want to comment quick that, uh, just, just f- final comment by me for the, a Sharpie case. He wasn't found innocent, but he wasn't found guilty. <laughs> so that that's the that's the difference there. So uh, they oh, just. I think we need a lawyer's perspective on this then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, they they couldn't give the ban him because they they didn't prove the prove the guilty guilty part. So I think that's the that's the case with uh, with a Sharpie. They just couldn't give the the ban ban to him. Irfan, what's your take on that? Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think what Miko said is is, is probably the most accurate. I, I think it, it's weird, right? It's kind of a technicality. I, I think they didn't exonerate him. Like they didn't like say he didn't say anything bad and that it was all some kind of misunderstanding or that nothing offensive was said at all. Like I, I don't think they exonerated him in any sense, but uh, the ruling did seem to say that you know they couldn't really confirm that anything was said that was you know um, offensive or racist, and as a result, you know taking action against the player didn't what was not warranted. So you know it's it's a little bit of both, um, and I, I think one of the things that's interesting you guys talked about was the relationship between Inter and Acherbi. I, I kind of think that that's overblown in the media, like. I'm sure they might not have been happy with the way he spoke to the media or addressed the media at all or ran, you know, whatever talking points he had by the club. And I'm sure the club um, and I'm sure he wasn't super happy that the club didn't jump to his defense and that a bunch of other players didn't jump to his defense. So I feel like in situations like this, there's bound to be a little bit of conflict. I don't think that there's anything untenable or or, you know, super um, difficult here that can't be worked. Um, but obviously the rumors of replacing him, like we also talked about, make sense given his age. Uh, so it's an interesting kind of dynamic, like maybe, you know, this, this shows them that they can move on sooner than they might have wanted to move on. But I don't think it changes much in the grand scheme of things. I think they're probably going to look to replace him with a viable starter in the first place. Now, who that is, like we talked about, I think will be interesting. The only thing that worries me about Varan is just his salary. Like, I don't know how we would support that. Um, maybe he'll take a pay cut to come play. But, um, you know, he's obviously pretty good quality. And there's a lot of tread on those tires, but, you know, there's not a lot of age. So you would think that someone like that could, you know, extend their career playing in Syria. So it's not a bad shout. Um, Buongiorno would be great. Schurz would be great. Uh, Scalvini would be great, but I just, again, I worry about with all the other news about what's going to happen with our financial situation with Oak Tree and all this, you know, how much money we're really going to spend. And I wonder if, like Sterling said, we might look for some kind of cheap veteran who's interested in um, extending their career and is a hard-nosed player uh, because, you know, the middle central back position doesn't require as much in the Inzaghi system as the right center back and left center back. And at least as of now, it looks like we've got, you know, the right players in place for those two positions. 
let me just say one thing on Scalvini. Um, he's not ready. Keep that kid away from my club until he's ready. I, I don't see any way that he's ready to step in, especially not in the Acherby role into into right now and uh, make any type of real impact that's positive. Um, every time I see him, I'm underwhelmed. I think he's frail. I think he lacks positioning. I'm not sure if his best position really is going to be even in a center back role or if he should be moved into the midfield. Um, I just, every time I see him, he leaves me wanting more. So I would say yeah. he'd be the one that I would steer clear of if I'm inter. Yeah, the only the only the only thing with him I'll say quickly before Miko jumps in is just I think part of what cuz I agree with you. I think there's a lot of scattered thought and mistakes and bad positioning by him, but I also feel like a lot of that is just Atalanta system and kind of what they um request for him to do. Like I I just don't I feel like he lacks a little bit of the discipline, mainly because the entire team lacks a little bit of that defensive discipline. And also because I feel like they encourage him and give him a lot of freedom to push up a lot and join the attack, which as a result ends up with him being really out of position or, you know, kind of scrambling and, and making some mistakes. So I, I do wonder if in the Inzaghi system, especially in the center where he's kind of forced to stay at home a little bit more and play in a more um, disciplined back line, if his performance would increase. Cause I think from a skill perspective and from a youth and like talent perspective, I think it's all there, but I do agree that some of his performances with Atalanta are definitely lacking, but I kind of feel like that's more Atalanta than it is him. Yeah. I was about to say that um, he's, he's, I think he's more of a ball playing center back, just like Bastoni, even Pavar. So I think he would, he wouldn't maybe fit to our system too well, or, or how do I say it? He he wouldn't be using all his skills uh, to the maximum in our system he, if he was playing like in the middle, and he would have to be there mar- marking the center forward and and uh, being the being the last guy there. So uh, given given what's gonna be his price if he's gonna move in this summer or the next summer, uh, I think it's it's not worth it for Inter in any case. Yeah, I view him as more of a right center. He, he reminds me a lot of Pavar, actually, if I were to give like a player-for-player player comparison. It's like a right center back who's maybe a little fringy on the defensive side who you might feel better about further up the pitch. So I, I do like him as a player, but I... In terms of what I'm looking for from the next center back for us, I kind of want one of those like rugged, tough defenders. I mean, we we all want Bremer on this team, but that's kind of the mold of the player I want, if that makes sense. So really from a table perspective, we have to be feeling good about where we sit and we have an easier run of fixtures coming up. Next match, of course, is Udinese. Next Monday, I don't know why you suddenly have this influx of Monday matches, but here we are. So we're playing a team firmly in the relegation battle. Udinese are, have the second fewest amounts of wins of any Serie A club. Only Salernitana have more, a lot fewer wins than them. They have a ridiculous 16 draws. I don't even know how that's possible in a season. And they're they're not good. I mean, this is a team who... Like I said, it's three points above the drop. When you look at this Udinese team, Miko, like who, who are you looking out for? I mean, we talk a lot about Samardzic on this podcast because of the history with us. Um, to- Florian Toven is a former French national team member who has been playing for them and scoring some goals. It, would you say he's the big danger man? Like, wh- how do you rate them? Yeah, uh, I would say, to- how do you go, Tovin? Twan. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it, but anyway, th- this uh, French kid, French guy, uh, I think he's the he's the main contributor in their attack or offensive play, and of course, the the veteran Pereira, Pereira who's playing on the right flank. I, I think he's playing on the right flank at least in this Sassuolo match uh, today. He played there, and. Uh, uh, they, they combined their goal, by the way, these two guys. So I think those two and 
of course, Lorenzo Luca, who's the center forward. He's the really big guy there. I, though I don't know how many goals he really have. Uh, I remember, does he have only like one goal or something this season? <laughs> but uh, but I think he he could be dangerous in in set pieces or something. But uh, but yeah, uh, so much is. I think he hasn't had had that that good of a season this this one compared to last one, uh, and uh, maybe maybe he was a bit bit shocked because he he didn't got his got his transfer to Inter or Napoli or or anywhere, and he had to stay stay at Udinese. But uh, I think when it comes to this matchup. Um, I don't know. We, it's a feeling that we we've we've struggled there a bit in 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 the history, but I'm not really sure is that the case. Last season we we lost to them, but last season was quite a terrible in in the Serie A, and, and uh, I think this loss we we had last season like catapulted the the terrible autumn we had so but other than that i think we we've been struggling in in Udin. but if, if someone has has a record of of our games please please share it it does seem like historically we've had a really tough time at the Udinese stadium especially since they built that new one um and obviously last year we kind of got embarrassed over there um but this this Udinese team is just a different team this year than they were last year um De La Fuego is not walking through that door anytime soon this inter team's a different inter team obviously mentality wise than the inter team of last year as well um this should be a match that we we should get three points from really there's nobody in that team who's really overall that concerning I think maybe one person who we didn't mention would be um, Pereira, Roberto Pereira. He can sometimes kind of pop up with the with the odd goal here and there. Um, and obviously, Samardzic would be would be the other guy who can kind of pull some magic out of his hat from time to time. But overall, you know, looking through this team, they look like a team that's built to grind a draw, and um, that's what they've done pretty much all season. Um, they pretty much just draw against everybody and they they drew today again against a really poor Sassuolo team so you know this is a team I think that we should you know obviously be looking to get the three points against as we really should with any team in this league but um, I think that this should be a hopefully pretty routine uh, victory for us uh, assuming that we show up and do what we we need to do yeah I'm worried about this match only because I kind of feel like Lataro and Taram are both not in great form, like we talked about a little bit today. And then these guys are like, you know, draw merchants. Like, that's what they want. And given where they are on the table, like, I know they're not in the relegation zone, but they're not far from it. And I feel like now, from now on, basically, any team that's like, you know, 15th or below is basically going to be desperately trying to just pick up a point and do whatever they can to grind us into like a nil-nil or 1-1 one, one kind of draw. So we're going to be facing that element from from all of these teams, which maybe, you know, you can argue we've been facing that from those sorts of teams from the very beginning. But they'll be, you know, more motivated and it'll be more in front of their mind than I think it was earlier this season. So that's what worries me about them. They're not, they don't have the quality um, to really threaten us, but they're always kind of an annoying team to play. And I feel like we'll see that again this time. And Tavan is actually pretty decent. He's a good player. I think he scored for them today against Sassuolo. So, um, you know, he he's somebody that we do have to look out for. And Tamarjic is also, um, you know, not a bad player. We've completely neutralized him, I think, when we when we played him last time. But uh, I expect he'll be a little bit better this time. That that was a good point about the relegation battle in a in a sense that we actually play Udinese. Verona, Cagliari, Frosinone, and Sassuolo uh, for the rest of the season, and they are all all like battling for the relegation or avoiding it. So, so you're saying Milan's back in the race? 
<laughs> no, what he's saying is the only team we have left to play with nothing to play for is Milan. <laughs> <laughs> and Lazio. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's interesting uh, and makes makes these these so-called easy matches which are not the easy matches are less, less easier for sure because they're really really are fighting fighting for for every, everything there. I was going back on some old score lines to try and verify Miko's claim that we struggle when we go to Udine for matches and it seems like I, you know, mixed success. I wouldn't say anything that too startling for me. It's not like our record against Sassuolo, but it did bring back some memories of May 2013 when Udinese put us to bed five to two, <laughs> and our goal scorer was Tommaso. <laughs> what was it? Thirteen, like like over ten years ago, or yeah, yeah. yeah eleven years ago. Okay, okay well. Uh, our other goal scorer that match was Juan Jesus. <laughs> that was the height of the banter error. That was the banter error's Uh-oh. banter error. <laughs> I, I like distinctly remember, like, you know, for us in the US, like 5 30 a.m. matches against Udinese and against, like, you know, Cagliari or like Kievo or something. And those were like always the most painful matches because I, you'd be like completely asleep. And the match would be like, you know, super cagey and annoying. And we would end up losing them or drawing them disproportionately than we should. And for some reason, I remember like some painful memories of waking up early to watch Inter Udinese. And the Andonovic results, in like, a baseball <laughs> cap. That's all you need to see. That's all you need to know. As soon as you woke up and yeah, you saw Andonovic exactly. in a baseball cap, you just go right back to sleep. Inter fans tend to not be very optimistic. But one of my favorite running bits is people say, oh, we always struggle at the lunchtime kickoff. Oh, we always struggle on the late night kickoff after everyone else has played. If, if you ask Inter fans, there's not a single time slot that we excel at. It's true. We have to play We have to play first, but last, but right in the middle at the same time on a Saturday at 2.45. That's the only time we can be sure of a victory. Okay, okay now now I'm looking at this, this record. And, okay, what, what I said, it was pretty BS. We, we were like most... We have won, won most of these <laughs> matches for the past 10 years. So, yeah, maybe. maybe You'll be surprised. I... <laughs> yeah. You'll be surprised how often that happens. It's, it's one, I, I forgot what it was. I, I don't think it was Sassuolo because that's a, an actual boogeyman team. But there was some other team that we played. And, like, in my head, mentally, I was convinced that, like, we have a horrible record against this team. And, you know, we always struggle with them. And when we actually look back, it's like been utter domination for like five years. But, you know, seven, eight years ago, probably on like a 5.30 a.m. on a Sunday, we lost to them. And since then, in my head, you know, we've consistently underperformed against this club. And uh, It's probably Atalanta. Yeah, maybe it was. I think you're right. It might have been Atalanta because we dominate them in the last like four or five years. Kyrie is another good one where you like feel like we struggle against them, but we actually own them. But uh, I'll give myself that for the past – Five five matches like this uh, away match against the Udinese. We've we've drawn two and lost one, so there's only two wins. Uh, All right, so Miko's past. predicting a one-one draw. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's tempting. <laughs> is is Bologna our boogeyman team now, or Sassuolo? Yes. Okay. Sassuolo, I'm ruling out just because they're about to be relegated and Berardi died. <laughs> so I, I feel like it is fully like we're embracing Bologna as the team we can't take points from. But then, like, would it still be a boogeyman team if they're like literally like fourth in standings and might be, or like they're fifth in standings and might end up in the top four? Like, you know, maybe it's just they're a good team. I feel like boogeyman teams have to be someone who's like really bad but still dominates you. That's why Sassuolo is such a good pick. Because they're typically never even, you know, maybe they're middle middle of the pack. But I don't know. Bologna might actually just be a good team, not a, you know, boogeyman kind of team. I'm trying to think who we struggle against here. I feel like we've had some cagey matches against Genoa, but we haven't really had any issues with them minus the dropped points earlier this year. Yeah, I, I, it's a good question. I feel like, I guess we'll keep giving Sassuolo the title of it. So if they get relegated, we might be in the market for a new boogie team. There you go. So... Let's go ahead and we can do some math predictions before we get into Jay's hot betting tips minus Jay. So, Miko, if you want to lead us off. <laughs> okay. The 1-1 one, one is, is tempting, but uh, I, can't, I can't do that. So I'm going to go 1-2 inter, inter win and, 
and the scoring drought with, will continue for our forwards and and, and I would say <clears throat> Chalhanoglu will get a penalty goal and then Fratesi will will seal it for us. Yeah, I'm going to go with a uh, 2-0 for us. I feel good now that we've gotten another win under our belt. Um, again, not that I was ever in the Chrysler Inter bandwagon, but um, it, it's something about this team and going on slides with Inzaghi tends to happen. Um, so it's good to just be able to kind of nip that in the bud before it even becomes a real issue because the last thing you want around this time of the year is Oh man, Inter's gone five games without a win, um, and obviously there's a derby coming up. You just never want those types of conversations to start happening. Um, so I would say now that we've, you know, scored two today, um, kept another clean sheet, another standard victory. I, I expect us to do essentially the same thing on the road against Udinese. I'm going to go with a zero-one win for Inter. KG tight match. Give the goal to Dumfries because he's kind of been an unsung hero. I don't know. Like, he, uh, among Inter fans, I feel like he gets a lot of hate and he is comically inept at times on the pitch. Like, this one, like, even today, I think he kind of like fell over when he was trying to execute a dribble. But <laughs> he, he, he did also have the, the assist to, uh, you know, to, uh, Sanchez. And I think he honestly has been playing a lot better. Maybe, because he's played a little bit more limited, so when he comes on, he really wants to, to to make a point. But if there's anyone who gives us, who's been giving us a little bit of a spark off the bench, kind of like Fratesi um, used to and still kind of does, um, it's been Dumfries. So I've been happy with him. Um, and if he gets a start or if he comes on as a sub, I expect more from him. So I think um, I'm going to give him the goal and uh, have us win uh, zero to one. He has actually three goals, five, uh, six assists. Uh, this season, so not not bad, given the minutes he's been playing. I, I'm also feeling a one nil. I just have no trust in our starting forwards right now. Like we talked about earlier in the episode, they don't look like they're in form. So give me a Sanchez to the rescue off the bench. I'm talking 82nd minute goal to seal the win and send us to three points. So. Jay's hot betting tips. Of course, Jay is out this week, so I had him send me his betting tip in advance, and I'm going to throw in one of my own because, let's be honest, you can't get much worse than Jay's track record. So Jay's official, like, Jay's hot betting tip is Milan 4, Lecce nil next weekend's. My hot betting tip (laughs) for you, and I'm not kidding, that's a real betting tip. My betting tip for you for a game you're actually going to want to, want to, want, want to watch is I'm going Roma 2, Lazio 1 in the Derby. Roma are looking pretty good. Lazio are not. I, I'm feeling good about this call. Nice. But did, did you did you watch Roma today? <laughs> I did not. I was at work. Did they drop points to Lazio? <laughs> yeah, you should have watched it. Oh, no. <laughs> or, or, well, m- maybe not because they were terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, get, give me a Lukaku brace against Lazio. Um, and, you know, Lecce got their point out of the way, so they'll be nice and rested for Milan, so they will not try it all against Milan and, you know, easily be a step over for them. In all seriousness, though, about Milan, um, ha- have they looked better to you guys? Because I-, I feel like they've looked really good. No. Like the last probably no. three weeks or so. I thought they looked no. good. You-, you don't think they look good, Miko? They, they look shit. <laughs> 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 this is where Jay would be they like epileptic. Look... He'd just go crazy right now on Miko, but you know. <laughs> they always look shit to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought that uh, going into a really tough match at the Artemio Franchi after obviously the unfortunate passing of Joe Barone um, and, you know, very motivated Fiorentina team that equalized as well. Um, that they did well to come back and you know get that win and then and then see it out. I mean, I think they've been in much better form. They just look a lot better now that they have a fit Loftus Cheek in that midfield. Um, and I still think that they hit, there's holes in that squad, but also Pulisic has kind of come on with his form as well. So, anyways, I, I'm um, I'm happy the Scudetto race is effectively done, and we don't have to really find out how good that Milan team is in the stretch, but. 
I think that they have looked a little bit better in recent weeks. I think they've gotten better results. I, I still don't think they pass much of the, the eye test. We'll see. I mean, they, they I suspect that they're going to have a bit of a um, crash, you know, and, and get, get a few bad results coming up in the next couple of weeks. But they've definitely been grinding out results a lot better than they were previously, which I think is a good sign for them. Um, but I'll just say this before Miko jumps back in on Milan, that I think, uh, you know, you know how we don't let players bet on their own team. I don't feel like we should let Jay give hot tips on Milan because as, as a fan of Milan, it's usually like my hot tip is a three nil win for Milan and now a four nil win for Milan. So I just, I can't get behind it. I'm going to have to talk to him and say, from now on, your betting tips must be sans Milan. Um, give us something else to to think about only about inter yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> but 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 yeah yeah seriously it, it was a it was a nice result uh, for them to to get the all three points uh from fiorentina but I, I really really have to say fiorentina wasn't playing good the their defending is they're, they're absolutely terrible in that match but but yeah i, I can i can agree that they've been getting good results but i don't think they play too well the their defending is it's too i don't know it's too easy to break that it. high line was suicidal I think it's too easy to break it the, the, the defense and i'm i'm disappointed if we don't win them in the derby in, in few weeks i, I yeah. gotta say that they have poor individual talent in defense in my opinion but keep in mind, they also have the Europa League coming up. They they have to play Roma. They're on a, the easier side of the Europa League bracket. They avoided Liverpool and future champions of the Europa League, Marseille. So they're going to be trying hard to win those matches. You might see their Syria performances slip because in the back of their mind, they know the Scudetto race is over. Uh, Pioli had some comical quotes over the weekend saying he doesn't <laughs> think the gap is as large as 14 points. I know. I saw that too. <laughs> they were saying that had they 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 missed some key opportunities earlier in the season, and had they capitalized on those, it would be a much tighter race. Which <laughs> literally is the most generic thing anyone can ever say about anything. So it didn't surprise me that they said that. Um, but <laughs> honestly, I think part of the part of the problem is that you know we're we're looking around, sitting where we are. And I'm not. I'm honestly, I swear, I'm not being arrogant. But we're we're looking around, sitting where we are, and we're like, what's what's going on? What else do we got? And Right now, how bad Juventus is is making everybody else look like really good. You're like, okay, well, maybe Milan is like the actual real kind of threat because Juventus's form right now is so bad that uh, it's making everyone else kind of look good by comparison. Where do they have one win the last nine matches, something like that? Yeah, it's insane. Yeah, and it was in like the 94th minute too. And I think it was, was like, it was like Hellas Verona in like the 94th yeah. minute at home. I mean, they've they've turned to absolute garbage, man. I don't know what happened to Allegri and those boys, but um, it's been pretty embarrassing. I I think we we like de- destroyed their their mentality completely when we won. Them. I agree. Yeah, we did to them what uh, Jay always thinks Milan will do to us after we play Milan. <laughs> uh, you have to admire the audacity of Milan fans such as Jay to just have such swagger and confidence <laughs> after five losses in a row. All right. I think we can wrap up there. Sterling, thanks again for the uh, guest spots. Miko Orfan, have a good rest of your day, guys. Yes, sir. Thanks. All right. Thanks, all.